Hi, uh, my name is Ann Babson and I am uh, presenting this uh, film to you. Um, I look like I'm a little sunburned because I was out working in my yard today and now I'm, it looks like I'm talking to you via candlelight. Uh, I thought that this would be a helpful contribution to those of you who are reading We Cast a Shadow as part of our Common Read uh, program. Um, you've no doubt by this time uh, read the book on your own by the time you're watching this and had some input from your professors. Um, but I wanted just to point out something that may be obvious to you in this uh, era where there is a great deal of discussion of uh, the position and situation of people uh, who have faced a significant discrimination on the basis of race. Uh, one thinks of George Floyd, one thinks of many other people uh, that have been the subject of discussion in relation to the criminal justice system. Um, or uh, discrimination in education. I think of Colin Kaepernick, who got fired for simply kneeling, um, and uh, many other uh, people today uh, who have um, entered into a discussion uh, considering the worth of any life, human uh, life, um, uh, whatever, the race of the person, but Black Lives Matter simply states something that feels like it is contested in our society um, by at least some voices. And I wanted you to know that in this era of this discussion in the news, on social media, in the streets, uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin's book is magnificent but it's in co a conversation with other writers of color who have something to say about this time and this place in which we are all living. Um, and there are some magnificent works of literature that are engaged with similar topics. So the name of this uh, lecture is uh, We Cast a Shadow in Today's America. Ruffin's voice in chorus with contemporary African-American writers. Um, I don't think it is a surprise to you that uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin's novel speaks about a dystopian future in a fictional South. Just to make sure you understand what dystopian means, it means uh, a, a, a world that has fundamental problems that cause it to be a horrid place to live for at least some of the population. Um, uh, it imagines an America in the future, a South in the future, not today, but not a thousand years from today. Uh, though the future America is fiction in this book, uh, the author Ruffin speaks to us about the real America today. He begs us to think about questions in our own society based on what we see in his fictional work. He speaks about fictional racism in a fictional America to illuminate real racism in the real USA. George Floyd's murder um, was a cause in uh, the not distant past at, at all, for people to wonder, for instance, about the kinds of policing that white people receive versus the way black people receive. Uh, as a white woman, allow me to say that I personally have never been afraid that a, a cop would kill me uh, in any interaction I've ever had with him. And I don't believe that is simply because I am a perfectly law-abiding citizen. I think it is simply that um, the way I look um, engenders a different response in some cops than the way George Floyd looked. 
Um, Ruffin is not alone in this discourse about our times. Uh, I have placed here a photo of a retreat uh, of an African-American uh, writer's organization called Cave Canem. Uh, the man in the black beret seated next to my box is named Cornelius Eady. He is the founder of Cave Canem and also just a really, really good writer. Uh, he is not one of the people that I'm most specifically speaking about today, but he has created a conversation uh, with many black writers. In fact, uh, there is a New York Times uh, Magazine article that talked about black writers today a couple of years ago uh, that included a photo of Maurice Carlos Ruffin sitting in a room with uh, him, Cornelius Eady. Um, he has found a, a, a place where writers can, he's founded, I should say, a place where writers can talk to each other if they are writers of color and have uh, something to say about uh, the life uh, of uh, African-American cultures, plural, uh, African-American concerns, plural, African-American opinions, plural. Um, and uh, I want to share with you a few of the writers that absolutely do sit with uh, uh, Cornelius Edie and Maurice Carlos Ruffin in similar gatherings um, and what they have to say uh, about similar concerns as the ones that the book addresses. Um, this is a picture of Evie, Evie Shockley, who I believe teaches at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And she is a poet who works in kind of a uh, very sort of dry experimental uh, language. Um, and at the end of a, a theoretical book about poetry she, that she wrote called Renegade Poetics, Black Aesthetics and Formal in Innovation in African-American Poetry, she says this, African-American poets of the 21st century are writing not in a post-racial moment, but in a moment that is being called post-racial in the face of massive and increasingly violent evidence to the contrary. The meanings of race are more amorphous and the operation of racism is more difficult to articulate even for those of us who know it when we see it. Knowing it when we see it and articulating it is the project to some degree of the discussion of race in uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin's book, although the narrator is almost at moments an apologist for racist systems in his dystopian society. Uh, but that makes us, the reader, aware that he is has some cognitive dissonance. He's not quite on the same page as the rest of uh, the society in seeing things, certainly his mother and supercargo and other characters don't agree with his perception of things, which allows us to consider what he's looking at and seeing. Um, and so Evie Shockley is interested in this problem of articulating uh, the problem of racism in a society that is not o as overtly racist it, perhaps as it once was. Perhaps that's a very good thing. Uh, yet racism is not eliminated from uh, our society at all uh, to the point where we could simply say, oh, we're done. <laughs> we just solved that problem. Good for us. Uh, totally done. Uh, and it's harder to, to talk about it, but who better to talk about it than creative writers? Um, in her poem, Supply and Demand, she has this to say in her sparse language. If you had a million black boys, what would you do with them? Do you think we are made of black boys? Your black boys are all tied up in property. Most people don't know how to save black boys. Uh, this is a, a, a poem supply and demand from her collection entitled Semi-Automatic. Um, and the repetition of black boys almost has a mechanical uh, feel to it. Um, she's very interested in how uh, there is a kind of commodification of, uh, of young black 
boys. Commodification means they become a market commodity, something you buy and sell, something that is measured like a good, like a piece of meat. Uh, she criticizes the commodification of black boys. Um, another part of her poem um, says, it takes black boys to make black boys. Um, with this repetition, the poem seems to suggest that America might not care about the gun death of a black boy any more than we might care about the discarding of a flat tire. White boys might have intrinsic value uh, in American culture, but black boys in Shockley's critical gaze are not given such moral worth in the capitalism of this country. Um, that is Shockley's perceptions of this. I will say that with a large number of students who have been shot in schools, um, we might question uh, the value of children generally in our society, given our willingness um, to not take certain kinds of measures to stop um, gun violence in schools. Claudia Rankine um, wrote a book called Citizen uh, An American Lyric. Um, and uh, she talks about microaggressions experienced during life in America as a person of color in this book. It's a marvelous book. I'm having my students um, do a paper on it um, in relation to their work with uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin. Um, uh, and uh, Here's what she wrote uh, an, in an editorial that recently appeared um, in a national newspaper. Um, she talked about the atrocities committed against black boys in America. She wrote, I asked another friend what it's like to be the mother of a black son. The condition of black life is one of mourning, she said bluntly. For her, mourning lived in real time inside her and her son's reality. At any moment, she might lose her reason for living. And she further observed in this um, editorial, we live in a country where American assimilate, Americans assimilate corpses in their daily comings and goings. Dead blacks are part of normal life here. What kind of country do we live in? This is a question not dissimilar to the one that Maurice Carlos Ruffin's novel is asking. What kind of country do we live in? And, and what tragedy? And, and I, I also note that both of these poets are essentially agreeing with the protagonist uh, of, of uh, Ruffin's novel that there is an urgent matter for black parents related to the saving of black sons. Um, and uh, the solution of a racial reassignment surgery is one that um, we surely balk at as readers. But the problem is one that none of these writers are prepared to dismiss. Um, and I would say that We Cast a Shadow has its, its chief preoccupation, the commodification and reviling of the black male body. Um, there is a good deal of internalized racism in the protagonist. Um, he wishes to escape the blackness of his body and he wishes his son to escape blackness. Um, and we see in a society that so clearly has biases in jobs and justice um, and in housing and in so many other instances, uh, what he thinks is the problem, but what he proposes as the solution is one that the reader likely has problem um, accepting. Um, we see this starting in just the first chapter um, where what 
should be a networking meeting becomes more like an auction block for slaves. Remember the three black interns, only one of them can survive. They all have stereotypical um, uh, um, uh, costumes. They're not allowed to be something that doesn't correspond to negative stereotypes about black men. One is dressed as an inmate, another is dressed as a butler, and the third, uh, the unnamed protagonist, is given a costume to dress like an African uh, tribal dancer. And um, uh, uh, here's what, what he talks about it in terms of commodification of his body, the, the protagonist's body. Uh, silence. Armbruster covered his mouth with his handkerchief, his eyes locked on me. Octavia fanned herself. Somewhere in the room, a camera clicked twice. The loincloth had come undone, and I was naked as a peeled egg. Um, there's a poet who I greatly admire named Terence Hayes, who has very similar concerns about um, uh, blackness, black bodies in the time of this era. Um, and I can't recommend his collection enough. Um, American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. Um, I often say that it's truly the finest collection of poems written by any living poet in America today. I hope someone beats him next year, but this year he is still, in my opinion, the guy who wrote the best book among us who are living. Uh, his collection talks about living as a person of color in today's America and its challenges. He's not talking about a dystopian universe like Ruffin is, but he's interested in some of the same questions. Um, I wrote uh, for a paper I'm presenting um, at a conference. Uh, he begins his discourse in blackness in this hour with inside me is a small black animal bracing in a small stall. Inside me is a huge black bull, bald, small enough to fit inside. The bead of a nipple ring. My mother shaped my grasp of space. Would you rather spend the rest of eternity with your wild wings bewildering a cage or with your four good feet stuck in a plot of dirt? He, he's interested and the black body almost like livestock here, but he is absolutely interested in said black person, black body breaking free. Um, he writes also some similarly in another poem. He almost sees in his boy's face an openness like a wound before its scars, who he was long before his name was lost. The trail to his future on earth long before he arrived to be dead and alive at the same time. Surely the protagonist of Ruffin's novel, looking into his own son Nigel's face, has somewhat similar concerns, somewhat similar feelings of rapture and pain as are expressed in this poem. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar writes the poem, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and Maya Angelou writes a whole book about blackness in America of a title from that poem. Uh, so I say, surely Hayes invents nothing of a discussion of caged birds or caged black men, but he nevertheless wishes to implicate his reader when he writes, I lock you in an American sonnet that is part prison, part panic closet, a little room in a house set aflame. I make you both Jim and Crow here. As the crow, you undergo a beautiful catharsis trapped one night in the shadows of the gym. I make you a box of darkness with a bird in its heart. I find that magnificent. He, he, he changes Jim Crow to Jim is in gymnasium, a place where you build muscles and Crow um, simply as blackness. And the idea, I make you a box of darkness with a bird at its heart. Well, my goodness, what does a bird want more than to fly free? 
that is at at the center of this poem in my reading. And then one more fabulous poem about um, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. This is just my favorite poem I've read in a long time by a living poet. Uh, he rhapsodizes and imbues the word black with great power, particularly in this sonnet of all sonnets in his uh, collection. Um, I love this poem. I'll read it to you. Maxine Waters, being of fire, being of sword shaped like a silver tongue, cauldron, siren, black as tarnation, black as the consciousness of a black president's wife, black as his black tie tuxedo beside his black wife in room after room of whiteness. My grandmother's name had water in it too, water maker. I have wept listening to Aretha Franklin sing Precious Lord. I have placed my thumb on the tongue of a black woman with an unbreakable voice. I love your mouth, flood, gate, storm, door. You are as black as the gap in Baldwin's teeth. You are as black as a Baldwin speech. I love how your blackness leaves them in the dark. I love how even your sound bite leaves a mark. Oh, I defy anyone to write a better sonnet in, in this year. <laughs> Um, and if you know anything about the Congresswoman from California, Maxine Waters, you can understand that in her defiant conversations with people um, related specifically to race relations, um, why he finds her uh, worth a heroic elegy. Um, uh, and, and, and so here he has turned the fear of blackness that we see in today's conversation into something triumphant, a superpower, in fact. Maurice Carlos Ruffin has um, written about the American black experience by exporting it to the fictional South. Um, but he's absolutely writing about the same problems globally as these other writers that I've shared with you today um, are, are looking at. And I invite you uh, to consider um, picking up a, a book by any one of these uh, writers uh, for a further discussion of the same topic. Um, uh, what follows uh, uh, is a um, uh, bibliography I am putting on a slide. Um, you could also email my office for the complete bibliography of my research if you like. Thanks.